Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Easy Conversations, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host for Can Dandia. In this week's episode, I sit down with Carolyn Ritter, who is the author of the book The Swan Effect. Um, in this episode, Carolyn talks about the imposter syndrome, which is the topic of the book, The Swan Effect. She shares her own struggles with the imposter syndrome and what inspired her to research into the topic. Uh, Carolyn also talks about her journey with writing the book and why it was so important for her to share uh, the message around the imposter syndrome so she can also help others who struggle in a similar way. I hope you can get as much as I did from this episode. If you can leave at the uh, review at the end of the episode, I would truly appreciate it. Okay, well, Carolyn, thank you for joining the uh, podcast. Appreciate you taking the time. Super grateful for you to come on here and uh, have this conversation with me today. Um, but just to get started, I'll kind of give you some time here to introduce yourself, you know, who you are, where you're from, and, uh, and then we'll start talking about your book. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Well, thank you for having me first off. Excited to be on the podcast today. A little bit about me. I am originally from New Jersey and I moved to the Washington DC area for college and then stuck around afterwards. Uh, I'm a management consultant by day and also a aspiring author <laughs> to be. Uh, my first book will be published this April. It's titled The Swan Effect and it's about imposter syndrome and the advantages to feeling like an imposter in the digital age. Well, that's really cool and I guess as a management consultant, what inspired you to to write a book, especially about the the topic of imposter syndrome? Like, what what was your inspiration behind that? Yeah, so I promised myself that in 2020 I was going to do something that was outside of my comfort zone. Little did I know what type of year it was going to turn out to be, but I told myself last January that I just wanted to do something that was out of the box. And a professor from Georgetown had reached out to me and asked if I was interested in being a part of a creator institute. And the premise behind that was having the opportunity to write a book on whatever topic that you wanted to write about. And I was going through ideas in my head and I knew I wanted to write about something that was going to be helpful to other people and a topic that would be particularly relevant and maybe open up a discussion on a topic that you know isn't readily discussed. Mm -hmm. And when I was reflecting on what was going on in my life at the time, I was experiencing a bit of a, a quarter life crisis, if you will. Yeah. I was three years into my current job and I was just feeling a bit unsettled, to be honest. I thought that at that point I would be hitting a stride in my career and, and feeling confident in what I was doing and working with clients. I thought that I would just feel more qualified in what I was doing at that point. I was not feeling that way at all. I, I was constantly questioning myself, you know, how did I even get here? Mm -hmm. I feel like my colleagues are a lot more capable and smarter than I am. And I just had those internal struggles basically every single week. And I would say it was just really a struggle with feeling authentic as well. Um, and the life that I was portraying online and on social media was that I was happy and everything was going well, but inside I really just felt like, you know, I wasn't at the level that I wanted to be. And so I wanted to translate those kind of internal struggles that I was feeling in, into a way that would be helpful for other people that might be feeling that same way considering, you know, the issue with social media and the pressure to feel like you're basically posting your highlight reel for everyone to see mm -hmm. and struggling with that authenticity. And so from there, I started researching more about, you know, other people that might be feeling these similar ways. And that's when I first learned about imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And it really resonated with me <laughs> because I thought, you know, this is what I've been feeling all along. And I really just did it know that. I didn't know that there was a term for it and that 70% of people experience it at some point in their life. And so I wanted to explore that further because I was thinking, wow, if so many people are feeling this way, you know, why isn't there more discussion about mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. And that's what really 
kept me going and exploring this topic and then taking that lens with social media and technology on top of it because the original term imposter syndrome it was coined in the 1970s but it's been complicated by social media and by technology because you know that pressure to post your achievements online and how that makes other people feel and then also just with technology the overabundance of information that's available constantly makes people feel you know am i doing enough am mm -hmm. i am i qualified am i you know achieving all that i can compared to other people so all those things considered i was really thinking about you know how can I make this something that's helpful for people? Because at the end of the day, people with imposter syndrome, they are successful people. Mm -hmm. And no one really talks about that aspect. If you look at articles about imposter syndrome online, it's about you know overcoming imposter syndrome, combating imposter syndrome, but there's not so much on why are people with imposter syndrome successful? Because objectively mm -hmm. they are. And I experienced that, you know, my reviews at work, I was doing well, but I didn't feel like I was doing well. So I wanted to dive into why are people with imposter syndrome actually successful? What attributes do they have mm -hmm. that align with imposter syndrome that make them successful people and make them, you know, the types of people that are just better to adapt in mm -hmm. the digital, digital age. And part of that is because with the influence of technology, you know, certain capabilities that people have are going to be replaced <laughs> at some point in time but mm -hmm. there are characteristics of being an imposter having imposter syndrome that are valuable despite technology they're just personal characteristics that make these people myself included with imposter syndrome just you know be able to thrive even if they can't accept it for themselves right and so just for, for my own understanding, um, so what comes with imposter syndrome is you're not necessarily giving yourself the credit that you deserve. You're basically dampening your abilities because you're comparing yourself to others and others' achievements. Now, from a mental health perspective, based on the work you've done, is there, you know, because often like I hear a lot of people, and myself included, you go on social media, you see everyone's just having a blast. And if you're having a, a terrible day, it makes you feel even worse about yourself. So is there a component of depression that comes with imposter syndrome? Um, and, and were you able to kind of see that in the work or research you were doing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There is a component of depression, anxiety, a lot of just internal struggle. Because, like I said, it's really that feeling of not being authentic. And I think that that really is the basis for it because part of imposter syndrome is being scared that people are going to find out that you're not qualified and living in that fear. And mm -hmm. that can be, you know, very heavy weighing on you. If you're constantly worried that people will find out that you're not qualified for the job that you're in, or you know, you're not capable to do something that you're in the position to do. So that definitely weighs heavily on people. And that was something that I really struggled with is I felt like the person that I was at work was really happy and put together. And then I would come home and kind of take that face off and just slump down and <laughs> just kind of, you know, embrace whatever anxious feelings I was feeling at that point. But I think that's, you know, a big component of imposter syndrome. It, when I've talked to imposter syndrome coaches, they say that the majority of clients that they work with that experience imposter syndrome are in highly visible roles. Mm -hmm. And in these roles, they are objectively being very successful and people only see that composed image of whatever they're doing and not the internal struggle or the feelings of insecurity that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely that disconnect. And, and that whole notion was actually the background for my title <laughs> actually yeah. because with the swan effect the the picture that i'm trying to create there is with imposter syndrome everyone sees the successful composed person on the surface and they can't see the intense paddling that's happening underneath the surface when someone's questioning themselves whether they're qualified and constantly going through that personal reflection on what they're 
accomplishments are, what their capabilities are. So it's that realization that you really don't know what's under the surface for mm-hmm. another person. And I think that a, a lot of people feel that way in their positions uh, based on just the interviews that I've done. They feel that they're not qualified for the, the work that they're doing. And they are concerned that someone would realize that they're not as smart as their colleagues or their coworkers. And I think, you know, that just daily feeling of not being good enough or not belonging, that mm-hmm. can definitely contribute to feelings of anxiety and, and depression as well. For sure. Yeah. And I, I think, <laughs> and we're, we're all also in a very competitive environment, most of us, right? So that it's only natural that you do get those feelings of not being good enough or, or not feeling like, okay, I'm qualified. Um, I've experienced that in my professional life too. And um, I guess one of the things, uh, the crossroads I came at, and I don't know if this is relevant when it comes to the imposter syndrome is, you know, when, when you feel like you're not adding value or, or you're not doing purposeful work, um, you also feel empty. Now, is that something that you can relate to the imposter syndrome too, where it's like, okay, well, if I was doing something that I thought was meaningful, would I feel more uh, at peace or more fulfilled? Yeah, I I think that's definitely an an important point is having that connection to the work that you're doing. I, I think also an important point to note is imposter syndrome, in in my opinion, comes from a type of forgetfulness as well, because people that experience it are so focused on what's next and not what they've achieved to really get to the point that they're actually at. Mm -hmm. It's forgetting, you know, what achievements that you have actually made in your life to get to your current position. And that's not just academic achievements. That's not just professional achievements. That's also your personal achievements and the stuff that you have to overcome to get to where you are. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that aspect of forgetfulness and needing to remind yourself of what you've achieved to, to actually get to where you've gotten to, and then also evaluate to your point, you know, is this something that aligns to what I want to do and, and where I've come from as well? Is, is this, you know, the next logical progression in everything that I've achieved so far and, and where I want to go next? I think it, there's, just the nature of the environment is just to keep looking for the next thing, the next opportunity, and to always wonder, you know, am I achieving enough? Am I doing enough? And I think that it's hard sometimes to just take a step back and say, you know, is this aligning to what I've done? Is this aligning to my personal purpose in life? Um, and, And having those conversations internally with yourself about, you know, what do I feel like my capabilities align to aside from you know what's on my resume what makes me happy at the end of the day from a a career perspective and I think it's just hard to to think about you know everything that is on your resume I know sometimes you know when I think about the stuff that I I've done with my career I Mm -hmm. it's sometimes almost seems weird to look back and say, yes, I, I did that at some point in time, but I'm so focused on what I'm doing now and what the next step is that I've completely forgotten <laughs> that that was a step in this whole process and, and just not losing sight of, you know, where you've, you've come from and, and where you want to go next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's an important point because, you know, I've talked a lot about grounding yourself and being in the present and, and what you're saying is when people are often chasing the next thing you're not really appreciating the present and and not feeling grounded um i also read the high performance habits book recently and uh you know he talks about a similar thing where high performers are are always finding satisfaction with what they're achieving um and and then that's where you kind of fall off is when you're not satisfied with with the work you're doing so I think there's that core relation there in terms of what you're saying um so now with with the book um I guess for people that do struggle with the imposter syndrome 
um, what are some tips and tools they can use to kind of navigate around that and, and be more aware and mindful of, of some of the struggles that are almost sounds like self-induced, right? Um, so how do you, how do you navigate through that? And so the SWAN effect really explores how feeling like an imposter and having imposter syndrome is really an advantage. So it's shifting the narrative on imposter syndrome, because when you take the word syndrome, it sounds like something that's very negative and something that you would want to get rid of or a hindrance in some way. Mm -hmm. And it's really shifting the perspective on that and looking at what are the qualities that are embedded within imposter syndrome that make someone successful, even if they can't internalize their own success. And it looks at individual aspects, those personal characteristics, one of being humility. And that, to that point, so people with imposter syndrome, they have a hard time acknowledging that their own achievements are due to their own capabilities. They want to say that their achievements are due to luck or good timing, the hiring manager having a particularly good day that day and feeling generous and wanting to give them the job opportunity, whatever it may be. They have a hard time accepting that, you know, they've gotten to a certain place because they put in the hard work and, and they do have their own talents and capabilities. Mm -hmm. And so being humble is actually an incredible asset in the digital age, being a leader and a manager and being able to really realize that your own accomplishments and successes, yeah, there is an aspect that it's not just you. There are other people that are helping you get where you need to be. There's that whole story there that is the story to your own success. And it's not just you, it's the people that are supporting you. Mm -hmm. And so being able to be humble like that is just such an asset. And so it's really reframing the thoughts of imposter syndrome around humility. So instead of saying, you know, I don't think I know enough, it's reframing those thoughts into this is what I know, this is what I don't know, and this is what I'm going to do to learn to really get to a confident place in the areas that I don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's it's taking that aspect of humility and those thoughts of you know not feeling extremely confident and translate that into something that's really powerful because being humble, as I mentioned, is just so important, especially, you know, in a world of innovation, you need to be accepting of other people's ideas and to be a good listener and to realize that, you know, some of the best ideas are a collaboration of multiple people's viewpoints and, and not to fall into that, you know, personal bias of this is my idea and I think it's the best. It's mm -hmm. realizing that there are other ideas out there that could be better than yours and being an, an avid listener to those ideas. So, it's really about reshifting those thoughts and, and taking, you know, that inner humility and making it into something that is powerful and is really helpful to being a better team member and, and a better manager and better leader. So the purpose of this book is really to, to shift the narrative, as I mentioned, and, and take those initial thoughts that would seem, you know, I don't feel confident and I don't feel like I belong in this environment to, I do belong in this environment. This is a great quality that I have that's going to allow me to be, you know, the best team member that I can be because I have these characteristics. So dives into a few different qualities. Humility is just one of those as to why there is this imposter advantage. Mm -hmm. And I think it also reshifts, you know, why people are feeling like imposters. So people experience imposter syndrome when they're taking on a next step. There's a growth opportunity there. People wouldn't experience imposter syndrome if they weren't growing or expanding themselves in some way. If you're in a complacent position, you don't feel, you know, worried that someone's going to think that you're unqualified because you've been in that secure position. You really start to experience imposter syndrome when you're going through a phase of growth, when you're taking on a new job or you're taking on additional responsibility in your current role. It's just taking that, that next step. So really, I, I'm hoping that this book will normalize imposter syndrome for a lot of people and, and realize that it is just a, 
a key component of taking the next step in your career, in your life. It's, it's a leveling up, if you will, of mm-hmm. what you're doing. Um, and, and making it just more of a discussion topic than it is today, because when you think about how many people experience imposter syndrome, you know, more than 70% of people will experience it at least once in their lifetime. So it, mm-hmm. it's something that is, is common, but it's just not talked about enough. So making it not a taboo subject to say, you know what, I, I don't feel qualified <laughs> or sometimes I just feel like, you know, I, I don't belong in this situation. I feel like, you know, the people that I'm surrounded by know so much more than I do. It, it's acknowledging those feelings and, and feeling like it's, it's safe to, to say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And having that intellectual humility, normalizing that, because I think that that's kind of disappeared from our discourse today is admitting, I don't know something <laughs> because we don't want to seem like we, we aren't capable, especially in a job interview situation. We don't want to seem like you know, we're, we're not qualified for the role that we're applying to. So it's hard to say, I don't know. I admit that myself. It's really hard for me sometimes to say, I just don't know this, Yeah. but I, I hope this book will make people realize that it, that's okay. It's okay to admit, you know, I, I don't know this. I'm not an expert in this area, but I can certainly learn and get there. And I know that I know these certain areas very well, but you know, that's just an aspect of that introspection of evaluating what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. So hopefully this book will make people take that time for introspection. I mean, that's something that I did throughout writing the book is just take that time to think about, you know, where have I come from and and where am I going? And, you know, what do I have to do to to get to that next step, essentially? Mm -hmm. No, and yeah, I I think you've highlighted many points here. And I think even with the interviews or or just having that humility to say, you know, I don't have an answer or I don't know, um, but I can work at it really hard and figure it out. And I think being on both ends, like being an interviewee and, and an interviewer, I think that, you know, like just hearing someone say that automatically, you're like, okay, this person's humble they're acknowledging what they don't know and they're willing to work at it. And it just right away, you know, you see them in a different light. Um, The other point you mentioned about the negative self-talk and basically reframing it is really important because that happens in kind of all facets of life, right? Where our negative self-talk is probably the the most damaging thing we can do to ourselves. Uh, And whether it's imposter syndrome or whatever you're struggling with. And I think the key point that you've highlighted is being able to reframe it and saying, okay, rather than having that negative self-talk, acknowledging what you're good at and how you can get better. Um, But I do appreciate the positive perspective you've put on, you know, I know it's imposter syndrome, but being able to look at it positively because the only at a, the only point where you actually experience is like you said is where you're pushing yourself and and it look at it as a way of uh, of success because you are actually looking to grow and you are stepping out of your comfort zone so so there's definitely that positive aspect there now from from the process of writing a book like how long did it take you and you know like were there any points throughout the journey where you were like, okay, I don't know if I can do this. Or did you have that whole self-talk with yourself and how were you able to push yourself to, to, you know, get where you are today? Yes, absolutely. So I like to say that writing this book was hands-on research for grappling with imposter syndrome, because I would say it was no short of 10, 12 times that I almost talked myself out of writing this book because I kept thinking, you know, who's going to want to read this? Who's going to want to hear about my thoughts on this subject or read the research that I've done or the interviews that I've conducted on imposter syndrome? You know, why should I keep going with this if I'm not someone with a psychology background or, you know, someone with substantial career experience? I mean, I'm only really over three years into my, my full-time career. And so all those feelings I grappled with throughout the process. So I'd say it took me weeks to feel comfortable even putting words on paper for this book, because I just kept talking myself out of it. I just didn't want to 
put my message on paper. And it, it really took me that internal reflection time to think about, you know, why was I doing this to begin with? And it was because I, I wanted to help people that were struggling with imposter syndrome. And then I started to realize, well, if I'm dealing with this myself, then why am I not qualified to write about this? Because mm -hmm. I, I'm living through this right now. So even though I'll never be an expert on imposter syndrome, you know, I'm learning about it and I can share what I'm learning about it. And so when I started writing it a year ago, it really took me the longest time to just convince myself, you know, you can do this. You're qualified to do this, despite what you may think. That was the, the hardest part for me. And, and I'm, I'm glad that I, I did that because I, I have had the opportunity to connect with so many people that have faced imposter syndrome themselves across so many different fields and realize that there are commonalities in, in that experience. And, and the amount of feedback that I got of people who said, you know, it's so nice to know that there are other people that are feeling this way too. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's reassuring to know that I'm not the only one that feels like I don't belong necessarily at work some days because I, I worry that I'm not qualified enough for the role that I'm in. So having that feedback really kept me going along and pushing along and, and realizing this was an important message to share and realizing as well an, an important point that I talked about with an imposter syndrome coach she told me you know think about the distinction between being an expert in something and being a lifetime learner with expertise and I think that designation is so important because it's saying that you know calling yourself an expert puts a lot of pressure on yourself to know everything there is about a subject but saying mm -hmm. that you're a lifetime learner with expertise that says you know I know a lot about this subject and I know that I have so much more to learn about this subject but I can share you know what I know so far with you so accepting that kind of vulnerability and realizing that there's always room to grow that was really crucial for me in this whole process and to be comfortable being visible and and to some aspect as well exposing my own struggles with imposter syndrome admitting to other people i've experienced this before and that can be difficult you know especially being in consulting when i know that there are clients that follow me on LinkedIn or other, you know, public channels where I'm sharing that I'm writing this book. It's, you know, telling them I experienced this and, and I have these feelings and, and that's okay and normalizing it. So I, I really hope that it will make other people realize that, you know, it's okay to, to feel this way. And, and I just learned so much about imposter syndrome through this entire experience. And like I mentioned before, I, I realized, you know, I wouldn't be experiencing imposter syndrome to this degree if I wasn't doing something that was completely pushing myself out of my comfort zone. But that's an amazing thing. And, and I also learned about, you know, imposter syndrome is very situational as well. So you might experience imposter syndrome in a certain area of your life, like your career, and then you might get to a certain point in your career and not experience it as heavily because you're, you're getting to a place of confidence and you're feeling like, you know, settled in that area, but you might experience it in another area of your life as you're pushing to an, a certain area of growth in another area. So realizing that it, it is a personal experience, people will experience it to different degrees as mm -hmm. well. So for me, sometimes imposter syndrome, I felt like was translating into days of feeling very down on myself and, and depressed and, and letting it really cripple me. But then for other people, you know, they might not experience it that intensely. It might just be like these few fleeting thoughts about, you know, am I qualified to do this? And why do I feel like these other people are so much more qualified than I am? Like those fleeting thoughts versus letting it really, you know, be a, a heavy weighing monster on your back, essentially. So it, it really taught me a lot about my own experiences with imposter syndrome. And I'd say also how I interact with other people as well. Uh, i have a whole section in the book about emotional intelligence and empathy, because I think that's a really huge component of imposter syndrome. And I think that's what people with imposter syndrome do really well is they can accept that there are other people with imposter syndrome that are, that may be feeling uncomfortable or, or nervous about their own capabilities. So 
I think that personally it's impacted how I am as a manager and how I talk with other people because I don't want them to feel nervous or have these really tough insecurities like I've experienced. Mm -hmm. So I, I think like that commonality is really reassuring to some people as well to know that there are other people out there that are experiencing this. You're, you're not alone in it. And, and to have the capability to identify it in yourself and potentially other people, that's a really valuable skill to have. So I, I really hope that with the swan effect, not only does it make other people feel not alone in the struggle, but maybe for the people that don't feel like they're experiencing imposter syndrome, maybe they can be more aware of it and how, how other people might feel if they are going through this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a manager or in, or in a leadership position, how you are identifying imposter syndrome, maybe in your own team members and, mm -hmm. and how to maybe adapt your, your own leadership style to realize that there might be people within your teams that are experiencing this and to help them feel more supported. For sure. Yeah. And I think uh, you can even extend that to whether it's friends or family too, right? If you're seeing them struggle, at least having that awareness and being able to support them. Uh, I think one of the key things you mentioned there was people that do struggle with imposter syndrome also have this strength of emotional intelligence and empathy. And I think, again, if you were to take a step back and, and acknowledge that in yourself as a strength, that can also help you get through, right? Um, so, so I think that's important. And, and the fact that you said you weren't an expert, that almost probably would have worked in your favor too, right? Going in with a fresh set of eyes and not having your blinders on, you were probably able to not have as many biases uh, when you were doing your research. So, but I mean, kudos to you to sticking with it and, and you know, wanting to share this message so you can help others. Um, I guess- so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I guess the the other factor, like working full time and finding the time to do the research and the work and writing this book, like how were you able to balance the two? And did you find like uh, you had time for other things or was it like, you know, like how were you able to balance all of it? Yeah, it, it was definitely challenging to find the time most weeks to actually set aside a few hours to block off and write and plan and interview and all the components of, of the publishing process. And for me, it was about thinking, you know, what's most important to me personally to achieve. And of course, my career is very important, but I also knew that this project was very important to me as well, because I realized that I did have a message that I wanted to share. And that was the most important part of writing this book for me was being able to get these thoughts out to hopefully, you know, share these messages with someone else that might be struggling. And maybe it provides them a little bit more peace of mind, or at least maybe it, it helps them reshift some of their thoughts or or realize, you know, that this is not a taboo discussion topic and they can mm -hmm. talk to their friends and family about it a little bit more. So when I, when I realized how important it was to get that message out on paper, then I started finding more time in my schedule. Miraculously, I started blocking off hours either before work or after work or on the weekends, wherever I could fit it in, because it was so perfect personally important for me. Mm -hmm. And I stopped, once I finally stopped talking myself out of, you know, am I qualified to even do this? Then I started, you know, finding the time to connect with other people, to, to have conversations on their own personal experiences with imposter syndrome or their experiences coaching people that experience imposter syndrome, whatever angle it was. I, I felt like I could make the time to have those conversations, you know, because I, I really wanted to, to drive this project forward. So mm -hmm. it is really hard <laughs> sometimes, you know, finding that extra time when you have a, a full-time job that can even seem more than a full-time job. I mean, consulting the hours sometimes are just crazy and it's not a nine to five job by any means. Uh, but I, just thought about, you know, I have to get over that. I have to get over that block as an excuse for why I wasn't getting this done. Mm -hmm. um, because that, I feel like when I went through the book creator program, it, 
there were many reasons why people talk themselves out of writing a book and finding the time is one of them, but it's always backed by some other reason. It's not really about finding the time. It's mm -hmm. always some other aspect, like talking yourself out of it because you don't feel like you can actually write a book on a subject or a million other reasons besides actually the time component. So mm -hmm. once I got over, like I mentioned, those other reasons of, you know, wondering whether I was even qualified to write a book, then I started to make the time because it was something that was so important to me. And I just modified my schedule around it. And I, I did find time to, you know, be a human and socialize with friends as well as, as much as you can really in a pandemic. But um, I, I feel like that's something that I always think about, you know, is how I use my time because I think it's important to spend time on projects and creative passions that make you feel mm -hmm. fulfilled because sometimes you don't find all that fulfillment in your day job. I'll, I'll admit that <laughs> some weeks I, I don't feel like maybe my career is, is fulfilling me to every degree that I need it to. Um, for me, it, it, it is a lot of times that creative piece that I feel like I'm missing. So this allowed me to, to dive into that, to open up this completely new area for myself through writing the book, through creating an Instagram on the book and sharing posts on the matter and connecting with people. And that really made the whole process so worth it to me that I, I found the time when I needed to. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's amazing that you were able to, to commit to it and stick with it. And, you know, hopefully, well, the book's coming out. So that's amazing. And yeah, I, it all works out. <laughs> um, I guess one last question. So um, like, and I was just thinking about it, but like if someone's struggling with imposter syndrome and, you know, they, they do the work and they read the book and if they still aren't able to kind of navigate through that, you mentioned there's also uh, coaches that help. Um, so is that an avenue people can also take? Yes, for sure. And there are a lot of coaches that specialize in helping people who experience imposter syndrome combat those feelings, but in a way that's, you know, a, a positive way of going about it. So it's not just there's something wrong with you that you're feeling this way. It's more like, okay, you're doing a lot of great things and let me help you realize all of what you're doing. And be mindful of your own achievements. So taking that shift of perspective and, and realizing, wow, you, you've done so much and that's amazing. And it might be hard for you to internalize that, but you know, these are the kind of steps that you can take to, to begin to internalize your own success. Uh, mm -hmm. I think to some point though, imposter syndrome being so personal, it is difficult for someone to tell you, you know, that, you don't need to experience imposter syndrome or you shouldn't feel that way because you're successful or, you know, all, all these reasons why you don't need to feel like you're unqualified. It, you can't really take what other people are saying in that aspect and internalize it because that's hard to do. It is a personal experience. You need to, mm -hmm. for yourself, think about, you know, these are my achievements and these are all really amazing things that I've overcome to get where I am. And these are all the things that I want to learn. And while I might label them as weakness areas, they're really just not that I, I know so much in these other areas, but these are just the next steps or the next mm -hmm. things that I want to learn. So I think imposter syndrome coaches can be helpful in, in reframing the, those thoughts and, and helping someone to realize you know what they they have achieved but I think there's also just that really important component of introspection and really allowing yourself to embrace your achievements and mm -hmm. by far that's not an easy process is really hard to do but I think that just kind of daily reminder is so helpful and, and that's something that I've tried to employ in my own practices when I start getting spun up in those feelings of you know am I qualified to do this? Or, you know, what, what positions me to be able to do this type of thing? Um, especially when I was changing jobs, because that was something that I did um, amidst the whole process of writing this book on imposter syndrome was I was changing jobs. And that was a big, scary thing because mm -hmm. that slaps you in the face with imposter syndrome as well. And, and a practice that I 
employed when I was going through that was, you know, actually physically writing things down for myself and saying, you know, this is what I know that I'm good at. These are the skills that I know that I have. And this is the experience that I have. And, and these are the achievements that I've had. And actually physically writing those down helped me to realize, you know, I am deserving of this next opportunity and I can feel accepting of it. I don't need to feel like I, I I'm deserving or that I'm lucky to be here. And of course there are people that have helped me to get here and I acknowledge that, but these are the things that I've overcome to, to get here and, and to acknowledge my own journey. I felt like that was really helpful for me to do in that process. And, and so I, you know, encourage people as, as much as I can possibly do is to just write down those achievements that you've had and acknowledge what you've accomplished, even if it feels uncomfortable. I know it is kind of uncomfortable to talk about yourself or to think about, you know, this is what I've done, but yeah. really focusing on it helps so much to, to really think about, you know, wow, I did that. And, and that was really amazing. And, and for me too, was not only the professional and academic accomplishments, as I mentioned, but also the, the personal accomplishments, like, wow, I got to this point of, of being confident and feeling okay and contributing to meetings or raising my hand or, you know, those personal accomplishments mm -hmm. that I would never put on a resume, but they're important to me, reminding mm -hmm. myself of all those kinds of, of things. And, and even, you know, sometimes it means talking with your family or your close friends about, you know, what you've accomplished. And maybe sometimes you need them to help be, remind you a little bit about like, wow, you did this amazing thing. And that was so inspiring. Like, mm -hmm. don't forget that because that, that's so important to your story. So I think giving yourself that support network and, and reminding yourself about what you've actually accomplished is just, is so important to grounding you and to making you feel comfortable with taking that next step. Yeah. I think uh, it's almost in the form of positive affirmations, right? And, and yeah, having that positive self-talk. Um, no, I, you know, that's amazing. Everything you've shared. Uh, I really appreciate the message and, and all the work you've been doing. That's, you know, you, you have a lot to be proud of. Um, I, and if people wanted to get a hold of you, or if they wanted to understand imposter syndrome better, what's the best way to, to find you and yeah, reach out to you? Yeah. So definitely through my Instagram account, caroline.a.ritter, that's where I'll be posting, about my book updates and more on imposter syndrome and a goal for me this year is to really engage with more experts in imposter syndrome um so people that you know really have experienced it or coached people on imposter syndrome and can provide more insights on you know how they've gone about dealing with it and you know what makes their story unique in terms of mm -hmm. imposter syndrome and showcasing those in, in different discussions on those pages. I, I want to make sure that this message is continually out there and that this discussion keeps going. So I always love to hear from people who want to tell me their own stories because I am still, you know, in the writing process up until March and, and adding more content to my book. So I always love to talk to people about their experiences with imposter syndrome and how they've overcome it themselves or, you know, how they plan to overcome it or, you know, how they've interacted with other people with imposter syndrome. So all those angles to it, I love to continue those conversations with people because it's, it's great to make those commonalities across experiences. So I'm totally open to anyone that wants to chat with me more about it. I would love for anyone to reach out through, through Instagram and certainly can set up Zoom sessions from there. But um, yeah, I just want to keep this discussion going because I think it's important for people to know that they're not alone out there in, in these feelings of imposter syndrome and that it is really you know, a, a sign that they're doing the right thing and that they're in the right path for pushing themselves to the next step. For sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, and the book's coming out in April. Um, how can people get a hold of the book? Yeah, so I have a link on my Instagram page that allows people to pre order the book. And that's an important part of the publishing process for me is, you know, showing the, the publisher that there's interest in, in people that want to pre order the book, and there's paperback and uh, ebook versions as well. Uh, so if anyone wants to pre-order, you have that opportunity. Otherwise, it will be available on Amazon in April. So I'm excited to share my thoughts on imposter syndrome. 
Super cool. Well, thank you again for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, that's the end of the podcast. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And again, please leave a review at the end of the episode. I would truly appreciate it. Until next week.